Um, let me introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Philippe Bouillet. And Philippe Bouillet is the director of the Laboratory of Photonics, Numerics, and Nanoscience at the University of Bordeaux. And this is the Aquitaine branch of the famous Institute um, of Optics, which now is at Palaiso. And um, Philippe has a, a long history in atom interferometry. I might say he's one of the leading figures in uh, worldwide in atom interferometry. And Philippe obtained his PhD at the University at, at uh, Laboratoire Castel Bozel at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in 95. Then he was a, a postdoc fellow at Stanford and worked with Mark Kasevich at Stanford University. And there, he, I think he developed his love to charometers and gradiometers. And then he came back to Europe and joined the CNRS um, in the Institute of the Graduate School in 96. And there in, um, he worked um, on, in, in Alas Group, Alas Space Group, and he worked on, um, um, work on both Einstein condensate atom lasers and I think Anderson localization, I think was already at that time. And then um, in 2011, he was one of the figures who started to launch this academic branch of the um, uh, Institute of TIC in Bordeaux. And at the same time, he founded a company, MUCOMS, which, um, which is a company which um, builds laser systems and cardiometers uh, for applications. And this love to uh, precision interferometry to precision inertial sensing is also the central part of his talk. And we wanna look forward to your talk on quantum sensors with cold atoms, fundamental physics and applications for underground to space. Flip, please go ahead, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, extensive introduction. Uh, and it's, it's very nice to see, to, uh, see all of you uh, at, by Zoom. Uh, hopefully soon we will be able to do a real meeting. That's, uh, and you'll miss that. And uh, yeah, so I will try to give you a, an overview uh, of, of some activities we are doing and also trying to give some perspective that uh, actually can uh, also uh, have some openings uh, with respect to atomtronics, which is the, the, the main topic of this, uh, of this workshop, this conference. Uh, so let me uh, very briefly uh, st state what, we, uh, what I will speak about when I speak about quantum sensors. Uh, here we speak about atom interferometry and more particularly light pulses called atom inertial sensors that will basically use uh, laser cooled atoms or ultra cold atoms that we prepare in a particular state and that we manipulate with a series of light pulses, usually three pulses that will uh, basically create a, a quantum superposition of two states of different momenta and eventually different uh, internal states. And we use this series of three pulses to build up uh, something which is similar to a Max Zender interferometer in optics in the cent uh, central part of this picture. And we detect at the output of this interferometer simply by uh, fluorescent spectroscopy or CCD cameras, uh, the, uh, uh, whether the atoms actually exit in one or the other output port of uh, this interferometer. If there is a phase difference between the, in, in the interferometer, between the interferometer pass, then the signature is a sinusoidal variation of the probability to find the atoms in one or the other output port. What's uh, very interesting, and I make the story very short here, is that this uh, phase uh, difference between the different paths can actually uh, record uh, some effects. And in particular, because the atoms have a mass, you can actually be sensitive to inertial effects, rotation, acceleration. And in the particular case of acceleration, if in addition, you have uh, your laser that are vertical. In this case, you're measuring the acceleration of gravity towards the ground. Uh, then you can uh, find out that uh, the sensitivity uh, has a very simple scaling. It's uh, basically, uh, you are more sensitive as T squared and also as the square root of the number of atoms. This is the signal to noise. And it is also proportional to the uh, laser wavelength which with a typical atom like rubidium, a wavelength of the order of a micron and an interrogation time of the order of uh, 0.1 seconds, uh, you can have uh, the minimum acceleration change that you can detect is of the order of 10 to the minus eight meters per second squared. That's one billionth of the acceleration of gravity. And it's actually equivalent to a change of height if you're just uh, changing the position of your sensor by a few centimeters only. So this is very precise. And What's actually pretty exciting with those sensors is they're not only sensitive that you can change, that you can see tiny changes, but they are also exact 
Ex uh, in this case, it means that when you measure something, you know exactly what you measure. And this simply comes from the fact that the scaling factor or all the terms you see in the equation here are well known time and laser, laser wave lengths. And they are also very stable over a long term. And that uh, means that if you're measuring something over a very long time, if you see a, a slight change, that comes from the quantity you're trying to measure and not from uh, the instrument itself. And if you translate that, that into some, some potential application, uh, usually when we speak about uh, accuracy or exact uh, aspect, uh, you can refer to clocks, which means that you can know time extremely well, and then you define the second with no error over hundreds of millions of years. Uh, if you think about sensitivity, so how you can detect tiny changes, you can think about how you can use a gravity detector in order to detect changes of the gravity field over the ground to detect uh, under underground resources. And if you think about long-term uh, stability, you can think about acceleration measurement where since you have no drift, you can navigate, integrate the acceleration without the need of a recalibration, which you usually do with GPS. That's three aspects of the three different properties of uh, the sensors. And of course, what's nice is each of our sensor has the three properties at once. And that's why it makes them so interesting. And uh, as uh, Gerhard said, that's why I fell in love with that uh, almost 30 years ago now. So, um, so nowadays, you can buy it. Uh, as uh, was mentioned, we founded a company about 10 years ago. Actually, this company is going to a big change now because uh, there is a mer merger between new ones and a bigger company who specialize in inertial solutions. Uh, and we have now the third generation quantum gravimeter on sale. So it's already a, 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 a pretty, uh, so you see on the right side, it's the first generation. And on the left side, it's the third generation. The first one only works in the lab as shown on the picture. And the last one actually works on the volcano. It's a picture taken uh, on the top of Vietnam. And it's not just for commercial purpose. It's actually running there. Uh, it's been recording. Uh, uh, gravity over quite some time, except for the big uh, eruption where there was no current anymore. Uh, and as you can see, you can have some very good recordings where you can start to have some uh, signatures. And I'm not specialized in, in this in this field, but you start to have signature of basically how the magma is uh, is coming uh, to before, like prior to any eruption. And that's one of the aspects of the study which is done with this gravimeter. But it's been working there for months now. So that's. Uh, mature technology, as we can say, that you can actually uh, operate. Of course, it's still quite big, and you'll see that's part of the challenges we are looking at uh, in the future. The, the, the maturity of this uh, field and the maturity of this actually open away on uh, existing or uh, projects and ex existing experiments. Uh, you can find out actually uh, uh, like uh, these uh, systems for underground survey, even for uh, underground uh, laboratories. I will uh, like briefly speak about some projects on that, and also space uh, in satellite, on rockets, uh, in dedicated microgravity system, and even on plane or boats for uh, navigation purposes. And there are a couple of applications that I will cover uh, during my talk with some examples of what we're looking at uh, with my group in Bordeaux. So let me start with uh, uh, underground. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this project underground aims here at uh, really studying uh, long-term effects or long-term variation of acceleration and in particular gravity or uh, modification of curved space time uh, by using a large scale uh, sensor network. Uh, in that case, what we uh, uh, are doing is drilling uh, cavities uh, 500 meters underground, which is a very quiet place and build some uh, uh, network, which will be of the order of 100 meter long, uh, giving two aspects of the science that we can uh, study. First, the motivation is to prove that we can change the paradigm of gravitational wave detection with uh, atomic sensors, go to lower frequency, for instance. But it's also actually a very nice tool for geoscience, because it will actually provide the best gravity sensor you can have, even the best gravity gradient sensor you can have. So the, the idea behind the, the, this project is, uh, is really to measure gravity at different points uh, over the, 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 the propagation of a single laser. So this is the, the picture you see in the center here. Ideally, you would have many atom interferometers that are distributed over the same laser, the laser which will be itself used uh, as the, the interrogation laser for the interferometer. In this case, you can 
you can measure variation of acceleration at each point or variation of the phase of the laser at each point. It's, it's equivalent, which means that you can either look at a variation of space time, which will, which will actually be uh, translated into a variation of the phase of the laser. And if it's coming from a gravitational wave that was created by two black holes very far away, you'll see a linear variation, which will be read out on each of the nodes of your measurement. And then if you have some gravity fluctuation, which are much uh, smaller scale uh, and will have a special signature, then you can see a variation of basically the acceleration felt by the atoms coming from this uh, gravity variation and which will uh, be read out also by now a, a specific signal, uh, like a, a special signature on the sensor network. And because you will have different signatures, uh, thanks to this, uh, a network you can actually discriminate between gravity and gravitational wave which and this is very important when uh, speaking about measuring gravitational wave or observing uh, gravitational waves at uh, lower frequency uh, than the 10 hertz that you can do nowadays with laser interferometry because uh, all the gravitational noise that you have around your instrument if you cannot read it out then is uh, actually a problem the nice thing with this instrument is uh, the noise that you reject for one measurement is actually uh, the data that uh, the geophysicist needs. So it can do everything or it can serve many communities at once. And that's the, the challenge. For, for that challenge, we, uh, we thought that uh, putting the atoms into a laser cavity or an optical cavity is actually the best way to enhance the sensitivity of our measurement. And our prior idea is to use a fountain where we launch the atoms vertically and then make the atom cross uh, uh, the, the, the laser beam inside the cavity, which will be enhanced, and then do the series of three uh, pulses for, uh, uh, for, for the interferometer. Of course, in the future, you can also dream of having the atoms basically standing into the, the, the laser beam forever, and then perform some kind of interrogation of some sort by using other tools than just simply the fact that the atom cross physically the beam or that you can turn on and off the beam from the cavity. And for that, we've been uh, exploring possibilities to control basically the atom laser in, uh, interaction in externally in order to create a pulse, but not by pulsing the light. And for that, if you, uh, for example, go to, up, go to uh, another kind of atoms, uh, another kind of atom, like for instance, uh, strontium in this case, where you have a clock transition, and that's one atom, which is a, a good candidate for future atom interferometry nowadays, you can actually, uh, uh, quench the transition uh, or unquench it by just using an external beam, which is a dressing beam that will uh, increase the detuning between the two states so that if it's uh, out of resonance, you have no effect of the interrogation laser. If it's in on resonance, you have an effect of the interrogation laser. And thanks to that, you can actually uh, externally control the interaction. And this has two advantages. You don't need to pulse the light in the cavity, and that allows to scale up the cavity, otherwise, which will be limited by the, the time, uh, like the resonance frequency of the cavity. And on the other hand, you can also have the atoms sit in the cavity and then just make them resonant with uh, uh, the, the, the cavity light only when you want by using this dressing beam. Uh, this study is, uh, is, you can find it on archive and it will be soon published in, uh, uh, in PRI. Uh, so, where are we today with that experiment? Uh, so we, uh, we have a small version of the large uh, instrument. The small version is uh, only seven meter long. That's what you see on this uh, top uh, picture here with a cavity inside, which is a, a peculiar cavity that allows to have large wastes in order to make the atom interferometer. And we have one head, which is actually running on uh, such a cavity. We launch the atom and then uh, we record the, uh, the uh, interference fringes and what you see on the right side here are some the probability to find the atoms at the output of the interferometer. We change here the interrogation time of the interferometer. So this is still small time in this case. And the fact that you have some fringes coming to the fact that the laser is not exactly horizontal. So you still have a small uh, component of gravity uh, so that the atoms are in free fall. There is a phase shift coming from this. And of course, it scales at T squared. This is why you see these uh, fringes that uh, are uh, smaller and smaller when you go to larger and larger time. And we are able to perform actually larger interferometers. In green, it's an interferometer that uh, has uh, a large 
uh, momentum transfer uh, of uh, six photons instead of two in order to make larger uh, and more sensitive interferometers in this system. Of course, this is just the, the lab version or the preliminary version. And uh, what we are working on as well is to build the big, the big guy. Uh, we have finished to drill the cavities uh, and there are some tiny things that are being done nowadays like cleaning the cavity and get all the electricity. And the tubes are ready as well. Uh, they are all waiting uh, underground and uh, we will soon start uh, uh, building up the system. So by the way, if you love building vacuum chambers, you are welcome to come. There are plenty of bolts to tighten uh, and uh, we will need as many hands as, uh, as you can. So you're invited. It's a nice, very nice place, by the way. And uh, if it's too hot outside, then you can cool off and help us build the system. Okay, so that's uh, all about the uh, underground experiment. And now I will uh, go outside and actually I will go uh, uh, in, in the air or in space. Uh, to see uh, what are the potential applications of the sensors. Nowadays, we can uh, operate them in planes. We've been uh, working in this uh, very specific plane that you see now animated, which is the zero G plane. So for 20 seconds, you are in the same conditions that you would be on the space station. Uh, but there are also some other experiments that I will not mention, but I'm just briefly stating here uh, of using the same kind of gravimeters I showed before, but on boats to do uh, also some, uh, some uh, gravity mapping uh, of the uh, under, underwater gravity for, for applications to navigation or survey. So one uh, big interest nowadays is the possibility to use the long-term stability of these sensors in space. And it, it was actually uh, previously proposed as also a potential uh, replacement of laser space interferometry for gravitational wave detection by just using uh, the atom interferometer and the atoms in the atom interferometer as perfect proof masses. And then we can record actually the variation of space time curvature by just uh, looking at the time of flight of the light between two uh, perfect proof masses or uh, by uh, phase locking the two uh, atom interferometers. But actually, this uh, same kind of uh, instrument looks like a geodesy uh, instrument that uh, is flying nowadays. It's called GRACE. Uh, and then uh, our uh, uh, like uh, studies actually were trying to prove that uh, we can improve also our knowledge on uh, gravity mapping uh, by a space geodesy mission that uh, would actually use atomic proof masses instead of the current satellite itself as a proof mass. Uh, this has been uh, studied by the space agencies and there are actually now lots of uh, collaboration between uh, all the space agencies uh, towards this and show that you can actually uh, have sensitivities of a variation of the gravity gradient of the order of 10 to the minus 14 meters per second square on an equivalent uh, length of one meter, which is actually very good. And actually, if you translate that into mapping the gravity map, uh, as you see here, it's a simulation of what a space mission would do uh, by using cold atoms. And it's, it's uh, actually improving our knowledge of gravity by a lot. This is why, for instance, uh, in the next uh, European Framework Program, there is a dedicated uh, program uh, on developing such uh, a preliminary uh, engineering model of instruments for future uh, gravity space missions. Of course, we have not worked on that, but we uh, worked on testing an atom interferometer in an environment which is not the lab environment, as I said before, in, in a plane like that. It's actually, it's a very interesting environment. Uh, first of all, you can have fun if you're not sick because you can fly with the experiment. But second of all, uh, this environment has every uh, feature that you will have in the uh, real experiment, which is lots of vibrational noise and also a rotation rate, which is terrible. It, it rotates by about 90 degrees uh, in, uh, in 20 seconds. So that's a very high rotation rate. And we all have to cope with this environment in order to make these super high sensitive instruments work. So one way to solve it is to hybrid the system. And that's been an approach that has been, uh, that is now pushed by uh, a lot of instruments, in, in, uh, including the, uh, the commercial gravimeter I showed before, where basically you create your uh, interrogation laser beam by retro reflecting the light. So you create a standing wave, even with two frequencies if you're using Raman transition. Uh, so you reflect on the mirror and then you just record what uh, the acceleration of this mirror is with a classical accelerometer, which has to be very good 
that does not need to uh, actually be accurate and does not need to be stable over a very long time. You just need to record the high frequency components of the acceleration. And thanks to that and your knowledge of the interferometer itself as a filter, which has a specific response function, you can actually hybrid and reconstruct all the information from uh, the atom interferometer. Basically, if you run the experiment in a plane, it looks like this. And if you look at, if you try to look at some fringes, you see nothing. But of course, this nothing still has the signal you want to measure. It's just because you, do, you cannot know on which side of the, of the fringe you are, and you need to reconstruct that by the knowledge of the classical interferometer. This uh, is what we've done uh, now more than 10 years ago or for the first time in, in the plane. And this uh, showed that you can actually pinpoint the acceleration with the sensitivity and the accuracy of your acceler uh, like atom accelerometer, even in the noisy environment of uh, the plane why, by uh, correlating it with the uh, classical acceleration. And we've pushed that now for more uh, dedicated application to navigation by uh, coupling basically the classical accelerometer with uh, the quantum accelerometer in another way where we, we calibrate basically a classical navigation unit with the knowledge uh, which is very stable over time of the acceleration of the uh, atom accelerometer, the same way you would do with the GPS normally. And this allows to basically uh, 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 design a navigation unit with the high throughput of the classical system, but with the long-term stability of uh, the uh, quantum system. Uh, okay, so I'm, uh, uh, I'm almost there. Uh, so uh, I just briefly on the rotation. Rotation is also a very big problem. And, uh, uh, the, and, this, uh, uh, and because you have this uh, Coriolis acceleration, it actually uh, changes the trajectory of the atoms, which means that your atoms will actually not cross anymore because uh, when you rotate along the direction perpendicular to the beams, then the atoms will fly away from that. And this actually reduces the contrast. And this you cannot solve by some trick of measuring acceleration, etc. You have only two possibilities for that. Either you rotate your accelerometer in the opposite direction, or you use very, very cold atoms because of course, then the contrast depends on the, uh, the coherent length of your cloud. So for doing so, we've developed a, a microgravity simulator in the laboratory, as you can see here. And thanks to this uh, 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 simulator, we can access half a second of microgravity every 12 seconds. So we can do many measurements in the same environment that you would have in space. Uh, and this allows to develop uh, cooling strategies and etc. So for making uh, much colder atoms, we uh, had an approach which was to use uh, a whole optical uh, approach, not using uh, atomic chips, uh, because we believe that uh, you want to be able to turn off any external field for doing the measurement. So we used a cross dipole trap using some uh, advanced technique to really load and cool down, pre-cool the atoms to very low temperature, even before actually uh, using the classical evaporation uh, technique to go to BEC. And this allowed us basically to load the atoms then do a small sequence of uh, evaporation and create a BEC just before we are in microgravity. So in some sense, we do not create an ultra cold atom sample in microgravity, but we provide an ultra cold sample to microgravity and then perform experiments in microgravity over half a second, which means that uh, we can have atoms in there at very low temperature. Uh, you have here an example of uh, uh, the number of atoms measured in a small volume over 300 milliseconds. Uh, and when they are at temperature below 100 nano Kelvin, the atoms stay in this volume over all this time because we're in microgravity. And with that, we can actually now build atom interferometers. You need to be a little bit clever on that because it's not exactly the same way you would do in, uh, in, in, uh, on the ground. And we use double uh, diffraction techniques that uh, on one hand can make you uh, create two accelerometers of opposite areas or larger area accelerometer. And these are samples of the uh, interference fringes that uh, have been uh, uh, made in uh, our uh, microgravity environment. Uh, okay, so uh, all this, uh, actually, uh, all the discussion I had up to now was uh, a classical sensor in which I'm using a laser to interrogate, which means that I'm only measuring quantity in one direction. And basically all the quantity I speak about, rotation or acceleration are vectorial, which means that in principle, if I want to be uh, 
able to use that in, part, in a particular way, I need to record the three axis of acceleration or in addition, the three axis of rotation. And this has been a, a problem that uh, was there uh, forever. And the first uh, attempts to solve this were done uh, uh, on uh, multiple systems, uh, on systems where you can have multiple beams uh, that can interrogate uh, the interferom the atoms in, a, in different geometries, allowing to access rotation in one direction or acceleration in other direction. But this was done sequentially in the sense that uh, uh, all these uh, proposals were actually able to make some measurement, but not really to actually record uh, the, 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 the 3D components uh, with a single instrument and get the 3D information at once. And so that's a challenge nowadays for this for, for atom interferometry and inertial sensors to record the 3D system with a simple system. So we have uh, been uh, working on this uh, with two aspects. So the first one is uh, really to build a compact system that we can rotate in any, every direction. So this is uh, uh, what is uh, here. It's a rotating platform in the lab. And on the top of it, you have uh, our 3D uh, atom uh, accelerometer that we are actually studying. And the first thing we did is uh, still to do a sequential, like a series of interrogation, each one, every 10 milliseconds, we interrogate one axis. So we use the same beam of the mod to interrogate the, 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 the horizontal axis, the vertical axis, the other, other horizontal axis. By doing so and calibrating the system, we are basically able to record the full uh, vector. So this uh, on the curve here, you see the the three dimensions, that's the, the part which is basically uh, uh, going uh, up again uh, after uh, about one hour. But if you correlate all these measurements, then you can still integrate over a very long time. And this shows that even if your system is moving, basically by having the three components uh, measured at once or with the same instrument at a very fast rate, then you're still able to record the acceleration and its orientation uh, while the system is moving. This is one, one of the prerequisite of any application for navigation or uh, embedded system. But it's not enough. Uh, but uh, so it, but it's, it's not enough. We want to do more than that. And then in order to think about how to improve uh, our approach for 3D systems, we went back to uh, what we call this double diffraction technique, where you send two frequencies uh, that are retroreflected. And by just using the proper frequency and eventually proper polarization, you can select uh, two lattices that uh, are going in opposite direction and diffract, for example, in this case, a BEC uh, in one direction with one lattice and in the other direction with the other lattice. So starting from that, you can think that if now the two lattices are not collinear but are perpendicular, I should be able to diffract in two directions with uh, the same sample. And then you can extend that to a double, uh, double, double uh, diffraction uh, which is more like easier to create uh, experimentally, which means that in this case, you can diffract one sample into four copies that will fly apart from the, the initial one in different directions. So of course that, make, that can make a very complex uh, uh, lattice of, uh, of, of interferometers that uh, you cannot really solve. So our problem now is really to select the diffraction orders we want to emphasize in order to build an interferometer. And you can do that by just using the resonance uh, feature of uh, the, the diffraction technique. So if it's a Raman transition, for instance, in this case, by just choosing the proper detuning, the big detuning and the proper relative detuning between the beams, you can actually favor some diffraction orders and not the other one. And for instance, create a beam splitter in this case that will diffract an initial BEC into one part going up and one part going to the right. And if you make the calculation, you see that uh, for these two parts, you have the exact same Rabi type oscillations that you would have with the uh, uh, simple diffraction technique that is usually uh, used, which means that now you can really think of this element as the matrix elements used to build an atom interferometer, a full, uh, a full oscillation being uh, something like a mirror, it's like a, a, a pi pulse and a half oscillation acting like a beam splitter here, which is like a pi over two pulse in the classical uh, interferometry technique. And yet now you can build an interferometer using that. You, you uh, first pi over two pulse, then a pi pulse, which is redirecting the system, and then the last pi over two pulse, exactly the same way, but now you're building something which with a specific geometry. And here it's an example of one uh, uh, thing, but you can actually build more than one at once 
you can make, for example, four different interferometers in the plane that will uh, rotate in different directions, each of them being sensitive to one component of rotation and one component of acceleration. And if you make the good combination, then you can extract the acceleration and the rotation of each axis. So we, uh, we are exploring how to do that now. Of course, you need to uh, be able to read out independently all the ports of the interferometer, which you can easily do today with a BEC and a CCD camera. And from that, you can actually at once make uh, in parallel many interferometers that are in phase because they are, they're coming from the same sample and uh, that uh, actually allow you to get the measurement of all the type of uh, uh, acceleration quantities and rotation quantity. Just to, uh, this is uh, about my last slide. I just want to emphasize that in terms of duty cycle, that changes a little bit, but not much from what you would do in a sequential way in the sense that you still need, uh, when you make a measurement with an atom interferometer, you're not only making one measurement. You need a series of measurements. It's like for clocks. You need a series of measurements to scan basically where you are on a certain fringe and to extract also uh, all systematic effects. So it's maybe 10 measurements you need to, to have one point. So it will be the same here. But uh, the, 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 the fact that you have all the information at the same time is actually much different in terms of sensitivity to noise and sensitivity to any uh, uh, small uh, uh, drifts or bias uh, uh, that, we, that can act on the measurement. So this, uh, uh, I, I just want to finish that uh, we uh, have the prospect of uh, using this in a more integrated way now, because the fact that you can have many beams going all, all over the place but then select with the frequency the proper one to make the proper acceleration uh, made us think that uh, this uh, very nice optical chips, diffractive chips, where you can actually create a mod out of it by, because by sending one beam and then have multiple beams outside, you uh, might eventually be able not only to create a mod, but also to select uh, different uh, uh, atom interferometer geometries by just choosing the proper uh, frequency and polarization for each of the beam configuration coming from that, and then actually create a very compact uh, atom interferometer and 3D atom accelerometer, for instance. And this is uh, some research we are starting to, uh, to do nowadays. So with that, uh, I just want to finish by uh, mentioning the group in Bordeaux. Uh, there are many other uh, projects that we are on uh, going from uh, atom interferometry also to uh, uh, hybrid systems and, and, and quantum simulation. And uh, because uh, uh, today uh, quantum technology is very fashionable, uh, the Région Nouvelle-Aquitaine has now started a new quantum center for, for research, where we have some uh, openings for invited professors for short or longer periods. So uh, if, you are, if you want to enjoy the good wine and, uh, and, the, and the beach in Bordeaux, and also do some nice research uh, in quantum science, you're welcome to uh, contact me and uh, you, I'll be happy to invite you. Thank you very much. And the thank is from us. Thank you very much, Philippe, for this fascinating talk and all these new aspects of uh, precision spectroscopy, precision inertial sensing. I open up the discussion for comments and questions. <clears throat> and, and I might, might step in and do the first one because I, I, I see a chance to do so. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned in, in some, some time uh, in your talk that you want to avoid um, Trapped atom, guided atoms, and I can I can see that this is more most important for high precision sensing if you want to go to the ultimate limit. But do you think there's a niche for atomtronics devices with guided atoms to give prospect on your research as well? Uh, yeah, so it, it, it's true that uh, so far for very high precisions we uh, we really privilege uh, free falling proof masses because that's also the idea that. Uh, uh, the, 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 the more isolated the proof mass is, the better it is for, for, for precision measurement. Uh, and it's also that if you want to uh, actually open to uh, measurements nowadays, you need to use what's more mature. And so far, I, what's more mature is basically all these uh, free falling uh, atoms. Uh, I think that uh, one limitation you, will, you, you fall in when you want to uh, use this for like applications, mobile applications like uh, uh, navigation, for instance, is the fact that you will always be limited with a free falling system in terms of uh, a dynamic range by the fact that if you're turning too fast or if you're accelerating too fast, then your atoms will eventually crush on the uh, on the side of your vacuum chamber. And in this case, 
uh, you will need to, exp to explore a new uh, path for, for inertial sensing, which will uh, basically use or has to have to use trapped atoms or, or trapped in a certain way. So, and I think that's the niche, if you, as you mentioned, uh, for, for, for potential atomtronics, but not only because I think uh, the example I gave at, at the end, uh, even if it's free falling atom, if you're using these optical chips, uh, this is also some kind of atomtronics in the, in the sense, and you can always like re release the atoms for the measurement at some point, but do all the rest in a, in a trapped or in a uh, way. Okay, thanks. So I see three questions now. I would like to start with René Raiman, which I think was the first one to raise his hand. Yeah, perfect. Um, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, fan fantastic talk. So I, I have um, two questions. So one is more like a, a technology question, I would say, um, where um, where I wonder if you could tell us what the um, what the current technological limitations limitations of your sensors would be. So I mean, I know for interferometers you have like you you worry of course about the sensitivity, but there might also be a bias drift, for instance. Um, yeah, or some some conversion factors which might drift a little bit. So could you comment on this? What what currently limits um, your sensor and how you um, how you would improve this? And then the other question would be on yeah more on how your on your or maybe I skip the other question. I think this one is um, is enough for now. Yeah, thanks That's a lot. For 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 the cur current limits, it really uh, I think it really depends what you want to do with your sensor. Uh, so if I think of, uh, for example, uh, using that for fundamental physics, like testing the equivalence principle or detecting gravitational wave or detecting dark, dark matter or dark energy, where you will, at the end, really need to push the sensitivity uh, beyond the current limit nowadays. What we are usually facing is what you face on clocks as well, as uh, uh, really all, like have the best knowledge of all the systematic effects, like uh, coming from laser fluctuations, coming from vacuum uh, uh, emission, like vacuum fluctuations, and uh, like all, all these kind of things. The point is, it's not limiting because it's only limiting because you don't know it. Uh, and it might be limiting at some point because the fluctuations are too bad. But the nice thing with this sensor is, when, if you want to reach this level, you can actually have strategies to characterize the effect very precisely. And then once you know this effect, you can actually extract it and get the, the sensitivity. Okay, that is super. Then the other limit at some point is uh, is more like uh, if you want to, to do navigations, you need to be fast and you need to have, for example, a CW measurement because otherwise uh, you lose a lot by uh, having a, a, a very long duty cycle and you cannot recover that. And basically for that applications, the uh, quality of the, so we hybrid the system, but then we are limited by the classical accelerometer. They are not good enough to push the sensitivity of the quantum sensor to their limit. Uh, so either we find a way to make a continuous measurement with the quantum system, or we have to have much better uh, classical accelerometer. So that's another limit that's coming from this other type of application. Okay. And when you say continuous, what do you, when it, when it means like to measurement rate, what, what would be a measurement rate one would be striving for? Like you have to have a measurement rate of a kilohertz or something like this then? Uh, the no, I think you, uh, even if it's a kilohertz, right? uh, if, if you have dead times between the measurements, then uh, you will have noise that you don't have the knowledge of and that will yeah. Okay. So you so say it needs to be kind of truly continuous. Right? It can be uh, similar to continuous, like for clocks. Okay. Okay. Super. Yeah. Okay. I see a question by Bill. Bill. Bill, please go ahead. Yes, Philippe, that was that was really lovely and 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 exciting. One of the things one often hears uh, in talking about atom interferometry is that, of course, you want to use a a Bose condensate for the same reasons that optical interferometers uh, would rather use lasers. But uh, the Bose condensates have uh, strong interactions typically, and uh, People have been very uh, shy about using Bose condensates because of the, the difficulty of controlling those interactions. So would you, uh, how do you see this today? Uh, well, so the thing is, uh, it's, it's a little bit like in optics, you know, uh, if you do a uh, laser interferometry in optics, at some point you're limited by the nonlinear effects, especially in fibers. Uh, so in this case, you need to reduce the phase space density of your the, the density of your system, and not the phase space density, uh, because the uh, the interactions are only the density. So for BEC, 
usually what you need then is really to um, let the BEC expand to a level where the interaction become negligible. Uh, this is done by some lensing effect, for instance, like this uh, delta kick cooling techniques. It makes the BEC slower, but at much lower density, and then you reduce the interactions. Uh, some other aspects that we were exploring, uh, but then you need trapped system. If you want a trapped system without interactions, you might need to be able to use a fetchback resonance, and then only for specific atoms with low magnetic field, for instance, uh, that will uh, reduce uh, the interactions as well. But, but with a BEC that has been uh, expanding for a certain time, and then uh, which is by basically uh, super well collimated, so it doesn't expand anymore because it's uh, so, so large, you're not limited by the interactions anymore. Okay, thanks. Okay. So then let me please read a question from the question and answer section. It's a question by Eno Giese, uh, and it's uh, brief. And Eno asks, have you already seen multidimensional diffraction experimentally? Uh, no, not yet. So we, uh, we haven't started to study that yet. I mean, uh, everything is there because it's the same apparatus as the one that we used to, for the 3D accelerometers. And that's obviously that's our next step. Okay, thanks. Then I see your raised hand by Luigi. Yes, yes, I have a question. But maybe you, I didn't, I think maybe you touched a little bit on that. But uh, the question is, say, uh, very often, say, re recently, for instance, in the, in the case of uh, geophysics, so in the field of geophysics, so they want sensors, rotation sensors, basically able to detect uh, uh, rotations from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 11 rad per second, right? So do you have a kind of uh, sensors uh, or good that are good for that? In, uh... Yeah, so that's a, that's a very, uh, very good question. Uh, it's true that we focused a lot, even in the geophysics application, we focused a lot on measuring gravity gradients or gravity so far. Uh, also because that's where we, uh, uh, are the, the best uh, with respect to whatever you can find in the other type of technology. Uh, but of course, the, the nice thing with a, a matter wave sensor is uh, uh, that's the, with the same atom and almost the same lasers, you can change the, 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 the geometry of your interrogation and then be sensitive to, uh, to rotation uh, at levels that uh, start to be very good. I mean, there are this, this experience uh, in, uh, at CIRT with Arnaud Landrajan and Rémi Geiger, they are going down to uh, below 10 to the minus 12 radians per second uh, of rotation measurement. Uh, and uh, so that's very interesting. And it's also, uh, as you mentioned, uh, an, uh, an emerging field in geophysics, all uh, this uh, rotational geodesy, for instance. And uh, so we uh, basically started to, uh, to, to talk, to discuss with them. Uh, and it's fairly, it's fairly, between quotes, easy to, uh, let's say, uh, update or upgrade uh, this uh, network sensor, underground network sensor, to be able to measure rotation, because the geometry is already there. And, and in this case, we would also be able to measure that. So it's something we've been uh, looking at, exactly. OK, thanks. Yeah, then we we'll okay. use the chance to, to give Bill the chance to ask a final question. If one thinks about uh, comparing a falling uh, cube corner to atoms, you might think, well, it's pretty much the same. You're measuring the Doppler shift of a falling object. But in the case of the, the cube, uh, you don't have atom shot noise. Nevertheless, if I've understood correctly, the atom interferometers are better. So what is it that makes them better? <clears throat> Uh, well, so, so uh, they, uh, well, nowadays, I would say uh, we are about uh, as good as uh, the best falling corner cubes in terms of uh, rough uh, sensitivity. Uh, and uh, so, but we are better because, uh, so when you drop a cube, then you need to put it back before you do the measurement again, where you don't care about the atoms, they come back by themselves as soon as you shine the, the laser. And that's, that basically makes a very big difference because, uh, uh, Let's say when you uh, first, for example, if you move a falling corner cube gravimeter somewhere, then you need to reinstall everything. You need to be sure that everything is aligned, and then you need to be sure that your your corner cube will fall down, and it takes time. If your system is well engineered, when you come, the atoms are already there, and you just turn on and off the light, and it works. So this this is a practical way, but that makes the 
the system much better. And then the duty cycle is higher. In that case, you also gain in terms of sensitivity because you have more points for, uh, of measurement. And that's also a, a, big, a big aspect of it. Okay, so thanks again. Sir.